Good morning, and welcome everyone to the 157th annual meeting of the National Academy of Sciences. I'm Marsha McNutt, the Academy President, and I hope this meeting finds you all healthy and well. This is the first time in our history that our annual meeting is taking place entirely online. I am so pleased that many of you have joined us, and indeed, your participation is set to shatter all previous records for member and audience attendance. This meeting this year is truly historic, as it takes place in the midst of a pandemic on a scale that the world hasn't experienced for more than 100 years. To date, the novel coronavirus has infected more than 2 million people and more than 170,000 have died. This crisis has completely upended life for everybody, but especially for those who are serving on the front lines. We are all indebted to the first responders and healthcare workers who are heroically caring for the sick and to the many others from pharmacists to grocery store workers who are making sure that essential services are up and running often at great personal risk. Now, at this difficult time, the nation and the world are counting on science to help discover how this virus infects people, how to slow its spread, and how to treat those infected. Researchers in government, industry, and university laboratories in the U.S. and all over the world have united like never before and are working together around the clock to discover vaccines and treatments for COVID-19. Here at the National Academies of Sciences, we are stepping up in a number of ways to respond to this emergency. Together with our colleagues at the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine, we are working to rapidly mobilize critical expertise across the public and private sectors so that we can inform government response and recovery efforts with solid evidence-based guidance. Our members and volunteers have been remarkably dedicated in helping us to fulfill our mission under these extraordinary circumstances. And despite hardships, our wonderful staff continues to demonstrate the commitment tenacity and creativity that they normally bring to their jobs. For instance, we are now averaging over 350 meetings on Zoom every day. Because of these efforts, we can continue to help guide the nation through the crisis, just as we have done in the past, including through two world wars, the 9-11 terrorist attacks and the 2008 recession. Science is at the core of solutions to this pandemic and also to our eventual long-term recovery. As members of the NAS, you represent some of the brightest minds in the world. And fortunately, you are also among the most dedicated public servants. We are grateful for everything you are doing to help us respond to this global crisis. And we will no doubt be calling on many more of you to help in the coming weeks and months. I'll touch on some of the efforts that we are already uh, underway during the course of my presentation this morning. And I've organized them around the National Academy of Sciences strategic plan that we enacted last year. In this manner, I can be sure that we are making progress on all of the elements of the plan even though progress may not be uniform at all times. The first goal shown here is to apply science for the benefit of society. The first objective under this goal is to build communities across disciplinary and cultural boundaries. I hope that you will tune into the plenary session for the annual meeting taking place tomorrow when we will discuss the possibility of launching a series of civilization shaping grand challenges for science, which could build communities across disciplinary boundaries and achieve other laudable goals. But as just one example of reaching across cultural boundaries, in late February, two National Academy of Science programs 
LabX, and cultural programs came together and opened the doors of the NAS building to the public for an event centered around Eternal, an art installation of a 60-foot jellyfish made up entirely of plastic bags. 200 people attended an evening of interactive games and workshops to promote discussion of our individual and collective consumption behaviors. Guests were able to test DC rivers for microplastic, explore public plastic legislation around the world and vote on their efficacy and think critically to solve puzzles as waste management officials and in an escape room and more. Eternal is scheduled to be on display through June, although sadly, no one has been able to view it in the last few months due to the shutdown. As I've mentioned on previous occasions, the Academy's New Voices Group of diverse mid-career researchers has been a major asset to the National Academy in terms of connecting us to international young Academy movements, helping to find a more diverse pool of experts for National Academy studies and discovering new ways to reach younger audiences. Now, as we respond to COVID-19, the members of New Voices have partnered with the National Academy's Board on Higher Education and Workforce to host a series of conversations with academic, industry, government, and civic leaders across the country. Each conversation will focus on a specific topic related to how our nation's thousands of colleges and universities and the researchers who work there can support the COVID-19 response efforts. Their webinar topics have included questions such as, how can researchers help the national response efforts? How can laboratories shift research agendas? How can we crowdsource scientists to improve public information? How can we provide policy advice to the nation faster? And one particularly novel experiment from New Voices is shown on the right in this slide, and it's an AI-powered chat box that counters misinformation on COVID-19, and it is posted in their Facebook uh, page. The final objective in the first goal is to catalyze actions. Throughout the year, the academies have been busy addressing the hot topics of the day in an unbiased scientific manner such as the concern about foreign misappropriation of U.S. intellectual property through um, our research laboratories. With the arrival of the pandemic, these activities have been propelled to an entirely new level. Perhaps the most prominent example is the establishment of our Standing Committee for Emerging Infectious Diseases and 21st Century Health Threats ably led by former IOM NAM President Harvey Feinberg. This committee has been exceptionally active, turning around peer-reviewed rapid expert consultations for the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy and for the Department of Health and Human Services in a matter of days. The list of the topics that have been requested to address is shown here on the right. The activity is being expanded to include the social and behavioral sciences as the decision space and the question space broadens. In addition to the standing committee, I also include on the left side of the slide some other actions we have been taking since the start of the pandemic. For example, some of you may have seen the statement that the three academy presidents issued on the administration's plan to withdraw funding from the World Health Organization. We have also held a number of online events on topics of general interest also listed here. Now, before our buildings were shut down because of the pandemic, we managed to hold a major event designed to catalyze action around reimagining the future of science. With support from the Kavli and Sloan Foundations, we celebrated the seven 75th anniversary of the publication of Science, the Endless Frontier 
with a full day symposium to reflect on how much the world has changed since Vannevar Bush prepared his blueprint for the US research enterprise. America now has many more world-class competitors in basic research. The federal government is now not the only source of support. Big facilities and teamwork are more important to discovery and science is widely viewed as critical to national security, competitiveness, health, safety, and quality of life. The speakers and panelists discuss how our research institution and our research culture will need to adjust to these new realities if we want to remain competitive for the next 75 years. Now, our Science and Entertainment Exchange is a great example of a program that has been particularly nimble in response to the COVID-19 uh, emergency. The exchange maintains a robust calendar of in-person meetings for the entertainment industry in both Los Angeles and New York to connect scientists with script writers and producers to ensure that better science information and more realistic characters inform their Hollywood productions. The events are always well attended and often inspire new narratives and new characters based on novel science topics. But when the pandemic arrived, the demand for science consultations was high. So the exchange uh, quickly pivoted to provide a lineup of virtual events to satisfy the entertainment's interest in this particular topic in science. By partnering with cultural programs of the NAS and LabX, the exchange reached well beyond the customary exchange network to bring in new attendees. Topics have included the race for a vaccine, balancing the promise, the peril, and the process, uh, passion fruit to parsley, the science of victory gardens, um, a worst case scenario, COVID-19 ethics and triage, and um, uh, an event uh, not COVID related on alien oceans, the search for life in the depths of space to be hosted or hosted by Kevin Hand, and a future event with uh, Kirk Johnson um, of um, the um, Natural History Museum fame. Now, to ensure rapid communication of scientific findings relating to the pandemic, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, or PNAS, is making all coronavirus and COVID-19 research freely available by publishing relevant papers with a Creative Commons CCBY license, the most permissive license, that allows for automated text search and data mining. The journal is also waiving this normal surcharge on that open access, access license. Triage teams, led by associate editors, provide rapid assessment regarding whether a new submission is appropriate for PNAS and whether it should be sent out for review. Goals are to expedite the review of manuscripts, ensure that rapid review does not compromise rigor and reliability of review, and to provide authors with a quick response in case their work is a better fit for another journal. In addition, Authors of COVID-related work are encouraged to post their manuscripts as preprints when submitting to PNAS. Staff are following up more frequently on editor and reviewer invitations to ensure submissions are moving quickly. As of last Friday, PNAS has received, or a week ago Friday, I'm sorry, PNAS had received approximately 150 COVID-related submissions of which nine had been accepted. A collection of COVID-19 and coronavirus-related content is available on the coronavirus webpage um, at PNAS. Now, turning to international, COVID-19 pandemic is, of course, an international challenge that demands international cooperation. We have been working with other science academies, including the Pontifical Academies, to put forward a united front. 
Our joint workshop here at the NAS with China on urban sustainability is yet another example of how we are maintaining scientific connections during a period of strained diplomatic tensions. We are also planning an effort to help countries in Africa with their response to COVID-19. Now, throughout this address, I'm going to be highlighting uh, just a few reports from the National Academies that seem particularly pertinent to other topics of discussion. I regret that I cannot do justice to the many excellent reports that have come out over the past year. One that seems particularly worth mentioning is this report from the Transportation Research Board, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. One possible impact of stimulus funds to restart the U.S. economy is a reinvestment in infrastructure. And if that happens, understanding status of the nation's investment in highway innovation will be particularly timely and ready to come off the shelf to help guide that investment. Another topic, which I'm sure has been on the minds of many of you, and this study was almost prescient in its applicability to the current events, is this one on the health impacts of social isolation. Many of us can personally relate to this issue during our period of social distancing. But beyond that, many of us have parents in retirement homes who are especially suffering from the lockdown. It is tragic that this vulnerable population is hardest hit by both the disease and the isolation. This report is ready to help understand these impacts. Also quite relevant to the current pandemic is a new undertaking from the Academy's Gulf Research Program, a $500 million research program we are administering as part of the settlement from Deepwater Horizon. The Gulf Research Program has developed the off the Offshore Situation Room, which is serious interactive gaming to address possible scenarios that could jeopardize the safety and health of the Gulf of Mexico region. It allows stakeholders from local, regional, and national government, from industry, academia, and civic groups to explore how they would prevent, mitigate, and recover from a variety of fictional potential offshore disasters. This approach is obviously quite useful for other types of crises, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, and we are exploring how we might um, adopt this for COVID-19. Now on to the various objectives of Goal 2. Goal 2 is to improve public understanding and appreciation of science. The first objective under Goal 2 is to develop new channels of communication. A great example of this was the TED at NAS event that we held last fall with support from the Kavli and Simons Foundations. This all-day event at the NAS building was the first ever all-science programming by TED. Drawn from the ranks of Academy members and younger scientists, speakers shared engaging short presentations on topics ranging from neuroscience to astrophysics. The auditorium was packed with not our usual crowd in that the event attracted non-scientists interested in learning more. What I personally found fascinating was that when I asked attendees during the reception afterward which presentation had been their favorite, each person had a different choice. The speakers also benefited from the opportunity to be mentored by the TED coaches on how to speak to a general audience. One seasoned professor said to me, quote, it's too bad that it took me this long how to give a really great talk, unquote. The next objective under goal two is to promote the understanding of science. The science behind it is a program that targets the science interested public who are curious about what science says about current issues and also how scientists know what they know. The topics shown on this slide were selected from polling the public about what topics they're interested in. The information for the articles and videos is assembled from Academy's reports, but written in a manner that is accessible to non-scientists. We've generated a lot of interest with the public. 
For example, the int- the video on immigration has been viewed 86,000 times on YouTube. The third objective under the second goal is to build confidence in science and the scientific method. For some time now, we've been waging war against misinformation on the internet, one of several threats to confidence in science. Ms. Infocom at, N- at NASEM focused on health and climate science. The event addressed questions such as, what makes misinformation widely shareable and credible, even among demographic groups who are classified as highly educated and media literate? How can we restore trust in institutions and media organizations? This was a well attended event by um, major media organizations. As part of um, the war on misinformation, the Academy also hosted a Wikipedia edathon. Now, let's face it, Wikipedia is where the public turns to for information. This event was an opportunity for staff and volunteers to learn how to edit Wikipedia pages to ensure that they are consistent with authoritative science. Academy reports are excellent sources of information for Wikipedia articles because they are freely available on the web, no paywalls, and they represent the scientific consensus. However, they are rarely written for the public. Therefore, having editors who are familiar with the content and can extract pertinent information for Wikipedia and express it in the way that the public can understand it is a great way to counteract misinformation. And now, on to goal three. Improve the culture and practice of science. The first objective under goal three is to motivate transformational thinking on the promotion and advancement for faculty. An example of an event we held in support of this objective was a workshop on re-envisioning promotion and advancement for STEM faculty. STEM faculty are expected to excel in their technical work, their teaching, and their professional service. Their career advancement is typically determined by academic peers evaluating accomplishment in these three areas, but is the evaluation of these accomplishments often focusing on proxies aligned with all the values and missions of higher education institutions, such as student learning, public engagement, innovative research, and research impact. This workshop was a start in what promises to be a continuing discussion on this important topic. The second objective under this goal is to set the highest standard for professional conduct. Some of you may recall the annual meeting symposium we held last year on the trustworthiness of science. Following up on that, we held a retreat at the Annenberg State at Sunnylands in Palm Springs to explore what expanded role there might be for the National Academies in coordinating excellence in research across all stakeholders, from funders through publishers. Currently, there are organizations that help set standards for individual sectors, such as the Committee on Publishing Ethics, better known as COPE, for publishers, but no cross-sector coordination. This slide shows some of the potential roles for the academies in these areas, such as aligning incentives with norms for science, coordinating policies across stakeholders, uh, promoting the study of effective practices, developing new resources, and distinguishing what might be systemic problems from just the occasional outliers, which might promote a knee-jerk reaction. The final objective under the third goal is to promote a scientific workforce of excellence and diversity. We are already leading by example in that the membership of the NAS is increasingly diverse in gender and geography. We do have work yet to do in terms of racial and ethnic diversity. Class and section restructuring committee will address changes needed um, so as to not disadvantage emerging fields 
and interdisciplinary scientists. Members have stepped forward with leading gifts to start an endowment to support operations of the Committee on Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine. As this photo shows, the future of science is much more diverse than what it was in our Founders' Day. Finally, to boost progress in promoting the representation of women, and particularly women of color in STEM, I bring to your attention this new consensus report that identifies promising practices for attracting, promoting, and retaining women in the scientific workforce. I participated in the rollout of this report, which took place after the COVID-19 lockdown. Our event drew an online audience of more than 500 who were engaged um, through prominent speakers, such as NIH Director Francis Collins and lively panel discussions. The questions that came in through the online audience were very thoughtful. Normally, when we roll out a report, we're lucky to get 200 people in our lecture hall. So this was a great example of how online rollout of reports can be very effective. Finally, in closing, I'd like to return to the COVID-19 pandemic and our efforts to help the nation to respond and to recover. From the beginning, the National Academy of Medicine's President Victor Zhao, the National Academy of Engineering's President John Anderson, and I have reached out to leaders of Congress and their staff, and we are in continuous contact to let them know how the National Academies stand ready to help in any way that we can. The urgency of the situation also requires us to accelerate efforts to transform the way we deliver and communicate advice to the nation. And we are implementing innovative mechanisms to help us respond more rapidly during this crisis. As we look beyond the immediate effects of the pandemic, it's clear that society will be dealing with the aftershocks for years to come. John, Victor, and I are working closely with our new Chief Program Officer, Greg Sims, to develop a strategy for how the National Academies can not only help leaders respond to the crisis, but also at the same time emerge a more robust, resilient society. To do this, our academies will harness the talents of our members and volunteers to create a strategy for a more resilient nation. I have no doubt that together we can and will help our nation emerge from this pandemic better positioned to take on other crises that will inevitably come our way. Now, none of what I have described to you today would have been possible without all our terrific volunteers and staff. You have given unselfishly of your time and your talent and also of your financial resources. Many of the programs I've mentioned today would not have been possible without your gifts to the Academy. For example, programs like the science behind it were entirely funded by member contributions. So I want to take today to thank all of you who volunteered for committees, for uh, offered reviews, um, served on award committees, um, our editors and reviewers for PNAS, served on our boards, our other activities, and opened up your hearts and your wallets to support our programs. And please, stay safe, stay well. I look forward to your participation in other events throughout the National um, Academy's uh, meeting in the next few days, and I look forward to seeing you all personally again soon. So thank you again, and so long for now.